listen to people maybe like me that have been doing it a long time, but find out for yourself. Take what we know. If you don't want to go that way, verify it and then and take that information and use it. I don't need a clone of me. I need someone who thinks differently. That's how we advance our technology. Welcome to Coffee Break, the official podcast of The Break Report. Here we dive deep into the world of brake technology, bringing you exclusive interviews with industry leaders and insights into the companies shaping our future. Let's get started. Welcome, I'm Brian Hagman, and my guest today is Dr. Mark Phipps, Director of Engineering for Bosch USA. Thanks for joining me, Mark. Hey, how's it going, Brian? It's good to be here. That's great, yeah, great great for you to be here. I appreciate you joining me today. So can you start off by just introducing yourself to the audience and explaining a little bit about your role at Bosch? Yeah, I am the engineering director for brake components in North America. So we are a group of three different engineering teams around the world, and I run the North American side. So we are a group of uh, about 30 people in North America. And you focus on the aftermarket, I guess, brake development, is that correct? Yes, we, we really stick to aftermarket, and we don't really look for anything else. We're just sticking to the aftermarket. So, so how did you get into friction material development? I mean, is, is that something you kind of fell into and said, hey, I kind of like this. I'm, I'm going to stay in this for a while. Or did you find it interesting early on? What, how, tell me the story. How, how did you get into this? You know, I was finishing up my uh, doctorate and my supervisor at the time says, hey, there's this uh, advert for this company in the, in the middle of England. But I think you should apply for it. So did that. Went for interview. They offered me the position in TNN Technology, which is the central research group of at that time TNN, and uh, working on friction materials. And you know, nearly thirty years later, I'm still doing it. So, so, so you started in England. How did you get to the U.S.? How did your journey get you here? Well, I was there in the Colston House in rugby for a couple of years. It was coming up all the way two years, and and the boss calls me in and says, hey, we got an opportunity here in the United States. Would you like to think about it? And I said, sure. You know, I'll, <laughs> what can, what's the worst that can happen? You know, don't like it, come back. So, so they said, why don't, you, uh, why don't you move to Smithville, Tennessee? So I said, yeah, whatever. That'll be fine. That's great. I guess in formulation or compounding, as they, you know, we kind of refer it to in the, in the brake industry, you know, developing brake pads. What's the academic background look like for someone looking to get into this or, or getting into this? Because, you know, as far as I know, you can't necessarily go to your local university and say, hey, I want to get I want a degree in brake pad engineering. Right. So what, what how do you get into this? What's your start? You know, I'm a chemist. And then there's a few people. I think the two guys who work for me are chemists as well. But that's not the only discipline that is applicable. So when I joined uh, Ferodo and started, you know, working on the friction materials, with the uh, intent of being uh, a friction developer, I had two people that were basically training me. One of those was a chemist, but the other one was a physicist. And I can tell you both, both had lots of releases in production. They were both successful, but they were, their methodologies were different. You look at it a different way. So you don't really have a single discipline, but if you really look at what would be most applicable, what we do is material science. It's material engineering, which is why you can see chemists and some physicists are in doing what I do and are just as successful as anybody else. Do you think, in your opinion, can someone with a mechanical engineering degree be successful if they had the right mentor? Or do you think they would definitely be kind of a fish out of water? No, I think it depends a lot on the person. Um, Yeah, you could be a mechanical engineer, but if you are, you can see the some of the physics behind these things, the material science. I mean, mechanical engineering has some material science involved in it. If you are, have that type of aptitude, I think you could be trained to do it. There is, I mean, yes, you need someone who's going to guide you. And, you know, my, that's a lot of my role these days is to, to guide people in our groups how to look at friction and maybe look outside the box a little bit. So I want to talk to you about drum brakes. So I guess to set this up, you know, so there's a little bit of buzz that I've heard, you know, for I guess maybe for a year or two now, or maybe longer, about maybe drum brakes making a comeback. And I guess to set this up, you know, disc brakes have been favored over drum brakes for years in the passenger car, light vehicle segment. 
So for starters, can you explain maybe the differences between the two systems? Yeah, I mean, a drum brake is as it sounds. You have the, the braking surfaces outside of the, the friction material. So the friction material and the shoes carrying it are internal to that system, and they move outwards to contact the braking surface and give you the torque for braking. A disc brake there on the side, and you're open. You have a completely open system generally, so that the, the disc gets more cooling. With a drum brake, you are going to see a lot more buildup of heat. If you do very heavy braking, that's what you're going to see. And the, and the disc brake is more efficient at handling that heat. So I get you may have answered this then. So what, what made the disc brake so so popular versus the, the drum brake? Yeah, it's the efficiency when you really load them up. They also, yeah, you can have warranty for both of them. But I think from, an, from my perspective, it's a whole lot easier engineering for a disc brake than it is for a drum brake. So if that's the case, obviously, so, so what, what, why would the drum brake even be considered if those factors are involved? I think as you move forward, there's a couple of different factors pressing on this. Yes, drum brakes tend to be a little cheaper, but I, I think they've always been cheaper and they've still been moving towards disc brakes. But you have a couple of factors coming up here, both with battery electrics and the real issues with battery electrics is going to be rust, not just rusting of the system, but when you have an open disc, they will tend to rust. And a disc brake pad is going to struggle to remove any rust on that rotor. Because in unless they really put some high energy braking into the blending so that it'll try and clean it, the low speed, low pressure braking that they tend to do doesn't help a disc brake pad remove that corrosion. The other factor that is coming in really from Europe is the dust emissions with the Euro 7. And if you go to more to more a drum brake, you know, you can try and enclose some of that dust. And I think when mechanics take a dust, a drum brake apart, they're seeing that dust come out. And you, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you see that warning, you know, don't blow the dust out of the drum because it will blow it in your face. But that two factors are starting to push back towards drums, at least on the rear. So explain that then on the EV side, though. So obviously, we're, we're, we're seeing a a massive, I guess, transition to EVs probably quicker than maybe we had anticipated. I mean, it's been coming for a while, but now it's definitely a focus within the market to shift to EVs. What about the EVs? If someone aren't, if someone hasn't necessarily who's listening hasn't driven an EV yet, or you know, don't necessarily understand, why would the EV play a factor in the, the disc brake or the drum brake? Yeah, when you have the battery electrics, you've got regeneration, you know, recuperation of that electric from the kinetic energy, and that means that the brakes are not in contact with the rotor. Once you don't have too much contact, the rotor actually rusts quite quickly. You may not be actually be able to see it, but sometimes we can see the effects on a, on a dyno under certain circumstances where the friction is suppressed. And that really pushes against the type of materials, especially in North America, which we use, which tend to be kinder to, to rotors in terms of rotor wear. So when you end up with that corrosion, it won't remove it. It'll just basically lay the transfer layer back over the top. And if that gets too large uh, in that transfer layer or that rust propagates, it'll start flaking and then you'll get, you'll get judder. So from a friction material perspective, you know, with EVs, are you having to, from, you know, developing friction materials, are you having to use different materials are you having to think about because of with the regen uh, breaking? Is that is that a factor, in, or is the materials just the same? You're just having to develop the same same patch, the different maybe the drum brakes are just more of an advantage. No, I think right now the the market with with battery electrics is not so large. Even with the aftermarket, the materials tend to last a lot longer because you're not using them as frequently. So we're not seeing massive replacement rates yet for the aftermarket. When you see fleets, so you see a few fleets out there with a lot of Teslas, they're doing enough miles that you would see a replacement. And yes, we are having to think about the use cases and how do we tailor the friction to better handle those conditions that it's likely to see that are not the same as your regular ice or hybrid. And as, as far as friction materials too, getting into like the, the development of of the materials and the formulations with Euro 7 and with brake emissions kind of heading our way, having to think about maybe using different materials. 
you know, is that a priority for you all? Is that, has that been a challenge as far as trying to come up with new formulations? What's, what's your approach when it comes to, you know, I guess, working with the, the eco-friendly components or, or, or materials? Yeah, I mean, there's two factors we're definitely thinking about. You have the emissions of it, and, and we don't see that in the United States yet, but my personal opinion is it will come our way. Bosch is investing in the equipment to do that testing in Europe. We do have dust emission equipment in-house to be able to develop for that, even though we're just aftermarket, not OE. We expect to comply as well. But I think when you see it in the United States, we are seeing on the sustainability side. There's definitely talk. It's, it's a priority for Bosch is sustainability. So it's definitely something we are starting to really take account of in our friction development. And, you know, being in the aftermarket too, you know, that's another thing I was thinking about is, you know, if you're on the OE side, obviously it's here and now. Aftermarket side, you know, the market is still maybe not quite there. The the, the internal combustion engine is still going to be um, – you know, out in the market from a replacement perspective for a lot, for many, many, many years to come. So how do you how do you manage that? I mean, are you working with any of the OE side on on developing pads? Is it completely different when you're thinking about aftermarket strategy versus OE strategy? Yeah, it is different for us. The uh, we 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 used to have an OE group doing you know brake development, and then now our North American side part of another company, and they were spun off in Europe. So we don't really have that contact anymore. So we take a look at where we think the market is going. We're trying to anticipate what the likely requirements are for our products going into that new uh, landscape. I want to talk, get your opinion on autonomous vehicles, because, you know, that's another probably still a ways off. But from a robo taxi perspective, you know, you have your cruises out there, your Waymos, the ride sharing market. That's testing in you know some of the larger cities like Vegas and San Francisco and some of these other places. I've never ridden in one, but I'm just assuming that maybe the driving experience is different. The behavior is different. This, maybe the driving style is different on an autonomous vehicle versus a, a human driver. So is that even on your radar as far as how you develop brakes or brake pad or no? Does that affect anything at all? I don't think it affects it directly. I think we are looking more at the vehicle itself. So if it's a standard battery electric, we would expect the autonomous driving to be similar. I actually have driven in an autonomous vehicle. We have one, it's a few years back now, in our Plymouth location, they are working on autonomous driving. So they took us for a ride in a, a Model S down the uh, interstate, and it was interesting, to say the least. <laughs> Were you... Uh... Were you holding on tight to the arm rail or armrest at all? No. I mean, it gets a little bit uh, sketchy when they tell you it, the, the system. It was a few years ago, so I know they've improved it since then. But they said at that time the system didn't like trucks and would tend to, <laughs> if it come up behind on a, behind the truck, it would tend to click off. But when you're going around a gentle curve, I likened it to a teenager. It, it kept correcting the steering. So it would like increments of little straights. So it would go straight and then it would turn a little bit and go straight and turn a little bit. So it would keep correcting. Yeah. I know it's been a while, but did you did you notice the braking at all different or no? Did it feel as smooth as maybe someone else driving? Yeah, we were only going at a higher speed, so it didn't really do it much. And then they weren't the level of autonomous they were working with at that point wasn't really ready for the main road. So it didn't really do a lot of braking. As soon as we started to come off, the driver took control again. Yeah. So, all right. So I want to talk about Bosch here. So what, um, being a large company, I mean, Bosch is huge. You know, it's a well-known name, brand name in the industry, global company. For your specific area, you know, you're working in, in the aftermarket here in the U.S. So what do you all do as a team to try to stay innovative, to stay ahead of the curve, to work on, you know, making sure that you're not only producing products that are performing well now, but also will in the future. So what, what, what things or what steps do you guys take to make sure that you guys focus in those areas? Yeah, we do a couple of different things. So one of the very vital ones is to attend industry conferences. So SAE, Eurobreak, are very good sources of what is going to happen in the future. We're also always looking at what, not just our competitors, but what the OEs are doing. So we're always benchmarking, pulling OE pads, checking different vehicles, where are they going on the friction level, where are they going on the control systems, 
to really dial in what we think is going to, what we're going to need in the future as a product offering, because it, it's not something we can come up with overnight for a new friction material. It's, it's a couple of year process to do that. Yeah. I was going to ask you when it comes to developing pads or I guess the materials performance wise or quality or, or whatever, even from a environmental perspective, how, how long, when you start working on a specific compound, how long does it realistically take? I mean, is it several months to, to come up with something? Is it several years? What, what's that look like, the process? I think it, it mostly takes several years, but it doesn't always. If you are, depending on the, the demands from our marketing group and our my management, if it's a very difficult requirement where they want everything, we're looking at a couple of years at least. Just the validation we have to run in Bosch when we go to the factory, different vehicles, all the dyno testing can, can take up to a year in its own right without the development phase on, on that. So a advanced material is definitely going to take two, three years. And are you starting from scratch in most cases? I mean, I guess if I'm thinking aftermarket, right, there's already a, a program that's been in the market. It's been launched by the OE. So the vehicle has been in the market for a few years. You're developing maybe a, a new part number for the, the vehicle. Is this something where you can just like, there's a template, you know, there's a, a recipe per se for these other similar vehicles and you kind of just tweak it or is it literally just, Hey, this is okay. It's a new vehicle. We've got to figure out exactly what this pad needs to, for this specific vehicle. No, it's generally you'll find reasonable materials will transfer to other platforms, but it's definitely something we keep an eye on in our, NPI process, new product introduction, if that vehicle is high performance or is it heavier than what we expect our materials to handle, then that will be will be flagged. And you definitely see that with battery electrics, they are quite heavy vehicles. Are there any projects at Bosch that you guys are working on that you're excited about that you can you can talk about at the moment? I can be honest with you. Anything that tends to excite me, I probably can't tell you. But yes, we are we are working on a couple of new materials that are advances to what we have today. What we have got in the market has been out there for coming close to 10 years with the copper freeze. We, we would want, I think we were the first to really have a product that you could actually go into a store and buy. And we are working on the next generation of those classes of materials. And, you know, it, I always find development of friction materials exciting. So, and, and I, I always think that's a, a great, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, but I still get excited by the development process. No, that's great. That's great. So before we wrap up here today, what advice would you give someone, maybe say uh, someone young in their career, early in their career, looking to get into either the brake industry or material development, material science, what, what advice would you give them? It's a tough one. Um, I tell, I generally tell my people that I've employed, you know, listen, listen to people maybe like me that have been doing it a long time, but find out for yourself. Take what we know. If you don't necessarily want to go that way, verify it and then and take that information and use it the way you want to use it. That's the way I think. I try to train my people is I, I don't need a clone of me. I need someone who thinks differently. That's how we advance our technology. I like that. No, that's great advice. Well, Mark, it has been a pleasure. I appreciate you joining me today and I really hope we can do it again sometime. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Brian. This is Brian Hagman, host of Coffee Break. I want to give a big thank you to today's guest and to all of you for tuning in. 